Good evening, Jen. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jen is speaking from Australia, so she's 11 hours ahead. I will make calls. Sorry? I will be very slow. Okay. Because I'm from Australia. Long way to travel for patients. Okay. Well, thank you, Jen. Uh, the stage is yours. Okay. Cool. So, I've been working with Google for the last 10 years, working on various stuff, mostly on AP6. And the most important thing you need to know about me is that all my slides are always in Comic Sans. So, if you, for some reason, Comic Sans intolerant, then you can just listen. So I was thinking, what could I talk about? And I decided I'm going to talk today about six common misconceptions for my have about IPv6. And I hope I could help you fill in all this bingo I think team just uh, announced. So, uh, next slide, please. Well, so I came across an article recently uh, which was saying, oh, this IPv6 thing, IPv6 thing, we've been deploying it for 25 years and we are not done, so probably it's not going to be deployed. And what struck me most uh, was, it's, it's not 25 years actually, Let's look at numbers slightly. Mm, can you hear me? Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, obligatory graph, which almost every IPv6 related presentation usually has. So if you look at this, we have not been really deploying IPv6 for 25 years. I would say it all started, it all be, stopped being just a geek toy somewhere around between around 2011, 2012, when first we had IPv6 day and enabled IPv6 for everyone for 24 hours. And then a year ago, a year later, we had an IPv6 launch. And after that, deployment started. So really, we actually have been doing this for maybe six and a half years. And by the way, I think it took five years from TCP IPv4 standard to be created until the flag day. In six years, it's I'm really looking at the scale of internet current. So next slide, please. So so the second part of this misconception that it's not going well, we've just seen 25% already, and we need to remember that this graph is actually an average, so it includes uh, networks which do, which do not have IPv6 at all. So this um, measurement page from World IPv6 uh, launch site, and I'm quite happy to see UK company uh, present here. So there are quite big, well-known players with more than 80% of adoption rate. 80% of all devices using IPv6 there. And this is called IPv6 is not going to be deployed. I just don't know. Uh, next slide, please. Unfortunately, we're really not there yet because I would say we do not yet have real IPv6 deployment experience because IPv6 is still being considered as a second class citizen. If you just ask a random network engineer to draw a diagram with example IPv IP addresses, I would quite sure that most people, even those who are working on IPv6, will use IPv4 addresses as an example. In the best case scenario, it will be the proper example networks. Almost likely it will be just 1.1.1.1. .1 .1 .1. 
again, I've been hearing too often, oh, yeah, we did test IPv4, but we forgot to test IPv6. Or, yeah, we configured IPv4 and we just forgot to configure IPv6. I think our end goal should be when you think about network connectivity, you think about deploying and testing IPv6, and then, yes, maybe, if you don't forget, you can test and deploy IPv4. Next slide, please. Yeah, most common one. I really did not even want to talk about this because we've been talking about this for years. I'm a bit sick and tired of explaining why people need IPv6. However, I realized that I might mention a few things which probably do not have enough attention, but they are important arguments uh, for IPv6 deployments. Uh, next slide, please. First of all, qu quite obvious thing, yes. If you won't come to IPv6, then IPv6 must come to you. If you think you have an IPv4-only network, you might be actually not quite correct. I have a deja vu. I worked with Cisco years ago, and for 12 years ago, actually. And we went to a customer, and we told those people about new shiny wireless solution, when you can put those access points and provide wireless connectivity to device. The customer engineers were, oh, no, we don't want this. It's scary. It's insecure. We are afraid of this. We are quite happy with our wireless network. And then we told them that you actually most likely do have wireless network already because people are coming and plugging some into the network and use them to get a network connectivity. And it was actually the case. So if you do not deploy IPv6 yourself, you might already have it on the network, but you do not control it, and it makes your IPv4 environment actually vulnerable to IPv6 attacks because most of devices have v6 enabled by default. Your network infrastructure most likely supports IPv6 by default. So you do have only connectivity over IPv6, but you do not have any security to protect. Next slide, please. Oh, this is very interesting. You might know that there are a lot of IPv6 only clients out there, mobile devices, because mobile operators do deploy IPv6 only. How could IPv6 only device talk to IPv4 only destination? The standard trick is to use DNS 6.0 and R64. So when v 6 only device is trying to get a V6 address for the only resource, let's say ipv4google.com, it will ask a DNS server, and the special DNS64 server will respond with special synthesized IPv6 address, which consists of well-known prefix, and the last 32 bits of that IPv6 address will be actually real IPv4 address of the device. As you can see on this uh, screenshot from my laptop, right? those last 32 bits of uh, V6 address is actually V4 address uh, in X format. And then V6 only client send packet to V6 destination, which then is translated by some NAT64 box. What, it mean, what does it mean? It means that if the zone is protected with DNS set, validating, then the client could not use DNS64 because DNS64 is lying about DNS response and DNS what is designed to protect uh, clients from the, uh, lying DNS servers. Next slide, please. What, did, what does it mean for you? It means that if you operate your DNS zone, you probably should use DNS set because it provides additional security for DNS. If you deploy DNSSEC, it means that you actually should deploy IPv6 as well, or at least consider it. But IPv6, DNSSEC doesn't provide much value for v 6 only clients, and even worse, v 6 only clients might have issue accessing a DNSSEC time zones. 
to those clients over the day. So to make it short, IPv6 actually good for security, for data security. We can look at this that way. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, now, if you uh, host some content, actually, IPv6 also is good for you because a lot of recent measurements show that, especially for mobile clients, IPv6 is faster than IPv4. Uh, here is a link to Akamai blog from two years ago. And their measurements show that for U.S. mobile clients, for more for main uh, mobile operators in U.S., those clients could access U.S.-based content in Akamai 10% faster. I looked at ethnic uh, measurements, which Jeff Houston does. And for U.K., it shows that IPv6 at average is 12 milliseconds faster. So you can consider some benefits from deploying IPv6 uh, for users, especially for mobile users. Slide, please. Next, uh, yeah. Uh, this is a slide from a very good, actually, very interesting presentation. Tom Napoleon from Apple uh, did at IETF uh, last year. And it shows that for US, for example, 87% of connections are made from IPv6 enabled network. I did not put it on the slide, but I think his measurements also show that an average IPv6 is uh, definitely faster for mobile networks. For, for Wi Fi networks, it depends. But again, uh, mobile networks do show better performance over V6. What does it mean for you, actually? Next slide, please. So, there are very interesting points that with the current V6 adoption rate and with a growing rate of not just IPv6, but IPv6-only clients, it's not if, but more likely when X could go to the conference or enterprise guest network and find that this network is actually IPv6 only. So systems like VPN, for example, most common in this case, does not support V6. You might need to deal with it. Even if you do not think you need IPv6 within your network, you might need to think about your public facing services. Next slide, please. So, if you're now convinced that you do need IPv6, you might still be in what I call scarlet mode, and you might say, okay, I'll think about it tomorrow. I might need IPv6, but not today. So, what's the problem with this? Next slide, please. Well, people who think they do not need IPv6, they probably put it into not important, not urgent bucket. Well, if you agree that you need IPv6, but not today, you basically think that it might be important, but not urgent. The question is, do you really want to be in important and urgent situation? I don't know about you, I not like to be there. I prefer to do things slowly and in a planned way, and Next slide, please. If you have to deploy IPv6 tomorrow, obviously you would need to sacrifice something, either quality or speed or money. Then the management might have some concerns about sacrificing money, and engineers might have some concerns about sacrificing quality. So the obvious thing to sacrifice is usually a speed of deployment. So that's why if you need IPv6 tomorrow, you probably should have started yesterday. Go into dentist only when you really, really, really have to, instead of going 
uh, for planned visits because if you wait until the very last moment, expensive, urgent, and quite painful. Next slide, please. So I can speak from experience. Deploying V6 does take time. So that's why, again, if you did it tomorrow, you, start, you should have started yesterday or at least today. You need to change the mindset of your colleagues, and it's quite hard. You need to ensure that people remember that IPv6 needs to be configured, remember to test it, understand why it's important. We need to educate them. And again, if you find a bug in the software or hardware which have, has just been installed, you now need to upgrade it, and it might take a lot of time to get a fix, roll, fi roll, roll the fix out, and so on. How long does it take? It depends on your life cycle management, right? It might take years, actually, if you need to replace hardware which doesn't support PC. Next slide, please. Yeah, one of the biggest mistakes people make, and we've made it, that mistake also, is to launch something in IPv4 mode and say, okay, I'll deploy IPv6 tomorrow. The problem is, now you have to touch production system, and you might need to make a, quite a big change on it. So I can tell you a story. I started doing some V6-related project on the network, and when I was doing this, most of my colleagues were, oh, come on, Jan, nobody using IPv6. It's 0.5% adoption globally. Why do you care? And to be honest, I was quite happy to do it when it was less than 1% adoption, because eventually I did cause an outage on the network for IPv6. But fortunately, it was just less than 1% of all traffic and mostly geeks, right? I would have been very concerned doing the same change today when it's 25% of all traffic. So obviously, the quiz, right? If you want to make a change and you want to touch a production system, what is the best time to do it? When, you, when that system serves 1% of your users, 25 like it's now, or in two or three years' time when the predicted rate is about 40 or even 50% of adoption. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, and for those who have waited, who have, if you haven't started deploying IPv6 yet, you have a great need. Actually, much easier now than it was 10 years ago. Seriously. I can, I'll tell you a story in a second. Next slide, please. Heavy, early adopters actually have done a lot of heavy lifting. We have reported a lot of bugs. We have requested a lot of features from vendors. The project I mentioned, which I was doing back in 2010, it took me five years to deploy. It was bugs, bugs, features requests, software upgrades, and so on. I finished in 2015 or 16. And then I moved to another team, and we did the same change in another network in two weeks. Because all bugs were fixed, all fixed were supported by the vendor. It was great. So I can guarantee you will see some bugs, but it will be less bugs than it was 10 years ago. Next slide. Yeah. Ah, by the way, uh, the this quote about I'll do it, I'll think about it tomorrow. The whole sentence actually is I'll think about it tomorrow, but I must think about it. So keep it in mind. So people who do work with IPv6 sometimes think that, oh, it's just uh, like IPv4, it just has more bits. So what I'm going to do when I'm deploying it 
I'm going to continue to do exactly what I've been doing for life with IPv4. I'll just copy all my operational practices and designs, with just replacing one address family with another. Well, I have some reasons to disagree with this. The next slide, please. Yeah, I know that it's a sensitive topic, and I'm probably going to open the whole can of worms here, but I remember wasting a lot of time talking to customers about their before address plan. We did spend a lot, a lot of time talking slash 25 or slash 24 on this subnet. Or maybe it could be slash 26. I am so happy now that I don't need to think about it anymore. It's always slash 64 for almost everything. Simplifies operations, simplifies automation, simplifies my design. So next slide, please. Also, a holy work topic, but I can now configure hosts in my network with just one RTT. So host sends a router solicitation, receives back a router advertisement, and it gets all information it needs to get connected to internet. It receives IP addresses, router information, DNS information, possibly MTU, possibly more specific routes, and so on. Which means also that any network changes when addressing plan changes or router changes could be easily signaled back to post. Another related change, between, another related difference between IPv4 and IPv6 implies that a host has multiple IPv6 addresses. And there is a very interesting work going on currently to allow applications to pick up IPv6 addresses for themselves. So just think about it. It probably would be never possible in IPv4, but in IPv6, you can have an IPv address for application. Another interesting thing which you cannot do with IPv4, but can easily do with IPv6, is using link local addresses uh, on link when we don't really need global address space. For example, you can build a backbone only has IPv6 global addresses assigned on loopbacks and links are link local. Uh, I set a backbone and I should say it works remarkably well. And it again uh, simplifies uh, operation and configuration. Oh, this is really cool. Thing. I really like it. Relatively new world happening. I'm. I do not have time to cover it all. The, uh, all details. So on my slides, there is a link to presentation. Uh, down on this topic. So idea is a lot of hosts are currently multi-home interfaces or they might have one interface connected to a network which is actually connected to multiple ISPs. For example, think about enterprise multi homing scenario. So traditionally, if hosts receive, receive configuration information from a every interface, it just combines it all together, for example, DNS information, and trying to use it randomly, which creates a lot of problems because uh, sometimes it does matter which interface the traffic is sent to, and it sometimes it needs to be the same interface which was used for main resolution. So multiple provisioning domains, domains is an interesting concept, which introduced the idea of a provisioning domain which is a set of configuration information which is specific for the given network. Laptop which connects to 3G and to local network, my laptop connects to at least two provision domain. Is 3G network, another one is local area network. And information about each domain is set in a router advertisement, 
when each domain is clearly identified. So PVD aware host will receive that information in array, realize that it's connected to various provisioning domains, and will treat this information as only specific to particular network. It would allow proper multi-homing, to allow very interesting solution in terms of path selection for the host to be able to select the best path for a particular application. Because network configuration information in this case might mean not just IP information and DNS, but for example, presence of captive portal, or if this network actually measured or not, and how much the traffic cost, for example. So again, it's quite cool new stuff and are doing currently part of it already. So next slide, please. Yeah, so after I've been talking about new stuff, which IPv6 allows you to do, you might think, and I've heard that a lot of time, that IPv6 is way too complicated. Again, let me disagree. Is it really too complicated? Let's think about it. My theory is we just expected something like IPv4 and we got something completely different. It probably just scares people because they do not get what they expected. To be honest, I spent some time on uh, studying how IPv6 works and it looks to be quite logical. You normally could see why things are done that way, what was the problem which people tried to solve and why this solution was chosen. Maybe it's just a lack of resources, so that's why I put on the slide a link to the very good book, which looks at IPv6 from uh, the very basics and tries to explain to you how would you build the protocol if you have to do it again? So I suggest everyone who is interested to look at this book. And after all, I've seen people dealing with OSP, PAGRP, redistributing those protocols to each other, redistributing them to BGP and BEAR, running BGP and traffic engineering policy with MPLS and, oh my God, globally routable multicast. Comparing to all those things, I really do not think IPv6 is too complicated. Oh, my favorite one. If you think you have done with, an, with de deploying IPv6 because you enabled it everywhere, you might be right, but you might want to double check. Next slide, please. The main question you should ask yourself, is IPv6 actually being used? Because I happen to troubleshoot a lot of networks, because when a network has broken V6 deployment, they usually blame Google, because they couldn't reach Google over IPv6. So I've seen it too many times when people deploy IPv6, but they do not monitor the result. Next slide, please. For example, real scenario, real traffic from one ISP. They did deploy IPv6, quite remarkable deployment, but then over, I would say, a year or year and a half, the IPv6 traffic and adoption rate was decreasing by 50%. Partially because at that point of time, they started ship new CPs to customers and those CPs had broken IPv6. And the funniest thing is the engineers were quite surprised to find it after a year and a half. Next slide, please. Another funny case, a random wireless network, which has IPv6 configured. Engineers, after deploying it, tested they could pin over IPv6 and everything looked fine. But apparently what was happening router advertisement, configured IPv6, but after five seconds, IPv6 was gone. What's happening there is that wireless controller was actually sending mail-formed packets on behalf of the router. 
software was too smart and was trying to do a proxy for a router. And the thing is, this problem was unnoticed for quite a while because nobody monitoring it. Next slide, please. Okay, so after you have deployed V6, please ask yourself, is this working? If it's working, is it actually used? Is the traffic level expected? Do you see any happy eyeball failures? Because maybe your IPv6 is just much slower than IPv4, for example. And despite the fact you uh, have IPv6 configured, all devices still prefer V4. And bonus question is, how much do you rely on IPv4 still? despite the fact you're using IPv6. Next slide, please. So, obvious solution is monitoring system. It helps them for IPv4. From my experience, I would suggest to monitor traffic level. And because I would say you should see at least third of your traffic being V6. And obviously, End-to-end -end connectivity monitoring helps for both before and v6. And I have quite a radical proposal is to consider even disabling IPv4 to discover IPv4 dependencies. Actually speaking from experience here, one of the cases when I was participating in v6 only networks was a number of ITF conferences. So next slide, please. So we did that. We turned off dual stack wireless network for IPv6 related working groups during ITF meeting in Singapore. Well, we did discover a number of network issues which were hidden by happy eyeballs before. So we did make network better by discovering this. And secondly, I sent a survey after, and as you can see, only 25% of respondents told me that they could not get the work done. The rest of them either were able to get their work done on V6 only, or had some issues, but more, mainly it was okay. Especially taking into account that the network had some issues, as I mentioned. So actually, I know that it might sound very unrealistic to many of you, of you but it's actually happening and it's possible. And I think I'm run out of time. So next slide, please. Okay, so I would say we are done when, when we think about network, we think about IPv6, and we, and we can finally get rid of most of IPv4 traffic. I would expect we're going to see a very long tail of IPv4, but I remember when we 5% of V6 adoption, people were saying, oh, come on, Jen, nobody is in IPv6. So I would expect when we get 5% of V4, we should be able to say, come on, nobody using the IPv4 thing. And that's all I have for today. I don't know if you have any kind of questions. Okay. 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 Okay, thank you, Jen. Can Jen hear me? Okay, yes, excellent. I Sounds can. like she can. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really a uh, different one, and I really enjoyed it, and I think the audience did. I'm not sure if you heard the reactions. So maybe time for one or two questions, if anybody would like to ask. Okay. Okay. No, I think everybody is thinking about what you just shared with us. And I completely uh, I agree with, with what you said, because I see it on our V6 only networks too, that uh, on dual stack, IPv6 issues can be hidden because IPv4 keeps people connected. Um, yeah, li hardware lifecycle is super important because if you've got something that is 10 year old hardware architecture, how do you want to introduce new features on it? And also, how quickly can you actually replace that? Especially if you've got a global network, that's a trouble. So everything that you said in your presentation was just spot on. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. Sorry, 
Could you repeat that, please? <laughs> but next time, I'll try to come in person. Yeah, we, we, will, we will synchronize it with your travel. But there is actually one question from the audience. Hi, Jen. Uh, Terry from Queen Mary. Um, quite recently, as in the last 18 months or so, Google has decided to um, rank sites that have deployed HTTPS higher in search rankings. Do you think it would ever be a possibility to rank a site higher if it is reachable over IPv6? <laughs> <coughs> uh, I would love to see it, but I cannot answer that question because <laughs> it's outside of my control. I understand. Okay. I think we should I'm go sorry. Well, either that, or would it be possible to start some uh, rumours among the SEO <laughs> organisations peddling snake oil that IPv6 would get a site ranked higher? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, definitely anyone can start rumours. You don't even need me for this, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jen. Okay. Thank you, Terry. All right. Excellent. So we'll Thanks. disconnect from Australia. Have a great evening. Thank you.